when I did the ravine, it was the first time I'd done in maybe 15 years where nobody fired a weapon. And then I realized, oh, he does fire a weapon. So, <laughs> yeah, so there wasn't a lot the of killing, continues. There, there, there's a little bit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hey everyone, this is David Stark from Watcher Pass. Today I'm talking to Keone Waxman, the writer and director of The Ravine, which is coming to theaters, digital, and on demand on May 6, 2022. We're going to talk to him right now. And while you're watching, if you can like and subscribe to this channel, that would be fantastic. It helps me out a lot. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. This is Keone Waxman, the writer and director of The Ravine, which is coming to theaters, digital, and on demand on May 6, 2022. It is a film about drama and grief and loss, but then also forgiveness and kind of moving past that. It, it has some really great performances, has a really lovely soundtrack, and some very kind of dark themes. So thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Of course. So I guess the first question is, this film is, I guess the script is adapted from a book that is inspired by true events how did you get involved did you like read the book and you're like i think i should turn this into a film or did they approach you saying hey we think that this might be a good film how did you get involved in this whole project they well they approached me with it um i've been doing a number of films with some uh companies in uh, that i've done a lot of action movies with believe it or not and somehow um bob and kelly pascuzzi uh, robert pascuzzi who wrote the novel um with his wife they they through channels uh got the book to me asked me to read it and when I read it, I just thought, you know what, this is a little departure for me. But at the same time, it's kind of the same thing because it really is just, a, you know, it's a study of forgiveness and it's a study of this. Or that, but the, it, there's some real life dark tones and there's some real life action. And so it just felt like something that I wanted to see if I could sink my teeth into. And so they said, yeah, go ahead and try it. So I adapted the novel based on just sort of meeting them and, and kind of vibing with them about what they wanted. And, you know, it does kind of seem to fit with your background. The, the shootout scene where Mitch took out the entire church uh, funeral home was, <laughs> yeah, it, it yeah, did exactly. feel weird, but it was so well done. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's, that's the thing. It's like, again, it's a little different because my background is like, you know, uh, action. You know, this is, I was, I was joking that this is the first, the first movie I, when I did the ravine, it was the first time I'd done in maybe 15 years where nobody fired a weapon. And then I realized, oh, he does fire a weapon. So, <laughs> yeah, so there wasn't a lot the of killing, continues. There, there, there's a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, so this is, uh, it's kind of inspired by true events or based on a true story. I, I guess, you know, how, but there are like some, I don't know, mystical elements for lack of a better word. Like right, right. how much of this story is real events? I guess, I guess it's inspired by events that happened in the uh, Percuzzi's lives, like their own yeah, personal it, life. I assume maybe there was some big loss or some horrible tragedy that they were trying to kind of grapple with. Do you know, you know, where the true events were, where the kind of uh, the, the movie magic happened or, or maybe, maybe you don't know, maybe that's just, you know. Well, I can, not... I can give you a little bit of the, out of the journey because the journey for them was this happened in their past, you know, mm -hmm. um, and happened with friends of theirs. And it was, uh, you know, obviously something that they had to work through because the, the story itself is how it really affected them, the Pascuzis. But really what it is, is, is a tragic event that happens in an everyday life. And this happened in their lives, their friends and, and families and, and their whole neighborhood just blew up because of this, you know, this murder suicide. And so they worked through it and wrote a novel based on it, but really based on just trying to, trying to figure out exactly how to make sense of what happened to their friends. And then, um, you know, when I got the novel and I looked at it and I said, okay, there's some great, you know, all this great stuff in it. But, you know, um, for them, a lot of the forgiveness and the understanding was trying to find their spirit spirituality. And I thought, you know, I'd shot in New Orleans before. And, you know, because I'd shot in New Orleans before, I, I said, you know, what, if we want to, and I worked with Eric Dane a lot on this, is we said, you know, if we want to take this and make it less of a specific, you know, healing and more of a kind of a mystical thing, mm -hmm. then it, it'll reach more people, it'll be more of a thriller, and what a better place to shoot than in New Orleans. And so we, had, so the adaptation from the novel to the movie ended up putting it in New Orleans, where of course then you're able to play with a lot of other aspects of things because there's, you know, New Orleans is really you know such a mystical place and such a wonderful place. Really, you know, there's nothing like it. And so it was sort of a, you know, sort of a change from what really happened to where we put it. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so that that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, being based in New Orleans, you have more of a yeah. Voodoo is the wrong word for this movie, but you do kind of have like a right. voodoo mystical type of underpinning right. to it. So it does kind of right, right. help this along for sure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, speaking of Eric Dane, I loved Eric Dane in this film. I thought he did a really good job. I thought all the acting was really good. Oh, uh, great. You know, it sounds like you worked with him. How'd you find the other actors? And have you gotten past, did you call uh, Eric Dane uh, McSteamy at all during this uh, production? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But uh, it's funny though because Eric, you know, Eric was a great boy. And Eric, if you look at if you look at what he did in this film, it's so understated. 
And he's so, um, you know, he really is that voice of, of not, I was going to say reason. He's that voice of trying to figure, make heads or tails of things. Whereas you have Terry, who really is the emotional voice of it. And she did a fantastic job. She was phenomenal to work with. And, uh, you know, her ability to sort of sum up kind of, you know, the question was great. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we found Peter and Peter Facinelli. In fact, really, he was the one who really was the glue because playing Danny, playing you know, the, 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 uh, if you want to call it for lack of a better way, the antagonist in it, mm -hmm. Peter really, uh, got the idea of how someone could get so desperate that they could do things that, you know, that we would never think about to our loved ones, to our family, to our friends and all of that. So between the three of them, you know, we really just had a great cast. Obviously we had Leslie Elgums, Byron Man, we had all these other people around it who, you know, I'd worked with Byron before I'd never worked with Leslie. She was phenomenal. Um, but those three really kind of like, you know, found it. Yeah. I really liked, you know, how you mentioned, um, you know, Mitch, uh, Eric, Eric's character and, uh, Carolyn, uh, Terry's character, how mm -hmm. they grieve differently. I liked seeing those two, you know, Mitch was more kind of, like you said, logical, trying to figure out like how this happened, if it actually was Danny and, and why it happened. And right. Terry was just more on the like emotional side of things. Like I have this big loss. I don't know how to fill it. You know, how do I get past this right, horrible right. event and seeing them and also the tension that it caused in their own relationship. Like I liked, I liked that aspect of this film where, you know, the loss wasn't just the people it was, it was causing issues in the people around them. It was almost like tearing at the seams of you know, the loss itself was kind of tearing at the seams of other relationships because of how big of an event it was. And, and these people dealing with it in different ways. Well, you know, I think that was the basis of why they, why the Pesquises made the movie, but if, yeah. first and foremost, why they wrote the novel. I think, you know, like any, anything normally, and again, I do action movies, right? So it's really like point A to point B, you know, so, <laughs> so, you know, save the girl, you know, find the money, you know, yeah. kill the bad guy. Um, but with this, it was like, that actually happens at the beginning of the movie. So then the whole rest of it is really like, how does it affect people? And that's really, I got into, it was like, how, how does it affect me? And with Kelly and, and Robert Pascuzzi, it was really, that's why they, I think they started this whole journey. You know, they wrote a novel based on trying to sort it out. And so a lot of what we tried to put in the movie, because you are dealing with the plot, you are dealing with who did it and why did you do it? You're all dealing with, you know, and what happened. But a lot of the, you know, the interesting stuff for me, at least, was, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what is the, you know, what's the collateral damage when somebody does something in your, in your life like this? And, you know, I don't think there's an answer, but I do think that, you know, it's worth looking at. Yeah, for sure. And you keep saying like, oh, I do action movies, but like this movie had some really good drama and some really good writing like i'll start with the drama the the scene mm -hmm. where the the character eric goes to forgive the you know his assailants right that scene was so well like the acting was well done his portrayal was well done like i went back and rewatched it so like that like that i love that really well i um, love that that's my favorite yeah. scene in the movie that's, oh, yeah. i mean really it is you know and, and i'll tell you because one thing about it when people see it you're gonna you'll you'll know what i'm talking about is that the weather rolled we were in new orleans right so, but the weather rolled in when we started shooting that scene Oh, wow. And it was a downpour and we had to stop for a moment and then it just kept trickling. But it really, especially down south, it was so tropical and so heavy. It really just made that scene work in a way that I didn't think it was going to. And then, you know, uh, Eric and Steve, they were so good. Steven was so good. I mean, those two guys were so great. Just um, they were, it was like battle of the understated, you know, <laughs> the understated drama. But I, 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 I'm glad that you like that scene. That's one of my favorites in the movie for sure. Yeah, no, I loved it. And then, um, the writing also, this has one of my favorite lines, I think, because it, it feels very realistic. There's there's one scene where, uh, you know, Mitch and Danny are talking and Danny goes like, you know, have you ever imagined life without Carol and the boys? And Mitch kind of turns and says, right. I don't know. Like, I, I do have a life with Carol and the boys. Like, I don't think yeah. about it. And I love that because you do always, you hear a lot, especially with social media and Instagram and all that stuff, like people thinking like, oh, well, what if, like, what if my life was different? But that's kind of not the reality. The reality is this is your life. You kind of right. deal with it and make you know, make the good from it or, or deal with the bad and make it your life. And that's you know, one of the underlying points of the movie, but it was so succinctly said. And Eric, like, like you said, he, it was a, a, a masterclass in like understated acting. He just kind of looked at him like, like, no, like that's not something I would think about. Like, why would I? And I, you know, it's funny to say that too, because like you said about social media these days, it's like, you can go ahead and say something online that isn't necessarily, you know, uh, what, what you're going to hang up, you know, you're going to, you know, walk out the door and it's going to be a reality. Mm -hmm. Um, what he's saying to him is Danny is saying, Hey, listen, you know, I've got all these things in my head, but I can't tell you. And he's, and you know, and Mitch is saying, but deal with it. Like you said, just deal with what you really have. And Eric being able to say it in such an understated, almost whispered, 
you know, sort of way makes you lean in and listen to hear what he has to say, which I think is the point of that scene. So, um, you know, again, I think that the understated, you know, version of, uh, of that statement is great. And uh, you, say, you keep saying you do action movies, and this does have a little bit of action. You don't normally yeah. see an indie film where, like, a prop, <laughs> like a car actually gets destroyed. Like, usually it's like, oh, the car is going to the edge, and then it cuts to some other scene. But here I was like, oh, my God, they, they actually get to do it. Like, whose car was that? And how difficult was that? To There's shoot? a funny story to that, because we had to go way up north, up to St. Francisville, to shoot that. That was where the ravine was, you know, because we were down in, we were in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Um, and so we went to the ravine. And then again, if you look, because we shot there for a couple of days, the weather was amazing. Clouds were rolling in. I thought, you know, we had lightning and thunder, this or that. Um, so, and again, having done action films, we had it all worked out. We had our, our stunt guys there and our effects guys were great. We had these big pulley and rig system, you know, system, uh, systems set up on the top and on the bottom, you know, you have to pull all the stuff out of the car so that nothing pours into the water. Two cars, everything is great. The night before it rained. And when we started, it was so much mud that we couldn't move the car. And we're like, oh crap, we have the drones up, like six cameras, like everything. And we had two cars for it. And finally, after, you know, like three hours of trying to move the car, they finally got it going. And it wasn't going very fast. And I'm like, oh great, we're gonna have to do another one. So we had two cars for it. And this one tumbled, but it landed so perfectly that we just said, forget it. And we used that once. We never used the second one. It looked like everything was gonna not work the way it's supposed to. And I think it came out great. You know, I really love the way it just tumbled over. It feels like someone accidentally spilled over the ledge, you know? Yeah, and then it also, I mean, to, I don't know, give credit in the film to Danny's belt and suspenders approach, but it does kind of also make his belt and suspenders approach to his suicide make mm -hmm. sense, right? Because he just, he was all in. And so if maybe if he hadn't yeah. had that backup aspect to it, he would have just kind of rolled over and then, but maybe that would have actually been a better scene for him. Maybe he would have like realized what he'd done, but you know, who knows? But yeah, I think, I know, right? <laughs> I, think, I think the way it was cut was really good. Cause you kept, oh, you kept thinking like, okay, so they're just going to cut away. And then eventually you actually like show it going over. It's like, Oh wow. They, they did it. They went all the way for it. So. Right. We were trying, well, cause, because that's our big, our big gag. We were trying to like hold off. And at the same time, storytelling wise, it's like, as soon as you see the car tumble, you can't just show it again. So it was always just a little bit, just a little bit more. But again, when you finally see it go over the edge, you realize the power of it. You know, I mean, at one point we cut all the sound. It was just going to tumble over in silence. And then we thought, you know what, uh, that's a little too, you know, playing with the cinematic aspect of it. Let's just play it with what it would sound like if, you know, if you were in the car. And we had one camera in the car. And in fact, we had one camera in the car and the we had a dummy in the car when it went over. And it went flying out and we had to actually digitally draw it out because it just, you know, ruined the whole thing. Yeah. So, um, so we went from trying to make it look, you know, very stylized to making, trying to make it look just as real as possible. Yeah, no, I think, I think that makes sense. You do kind of want that, that impact and that sound, and especially the, I don't yeah. know when you would have cut yeah. it, but the sound of Danny coming to terms with what he had done was, was an important aspect as well. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I know we have limited time, so I'm going to switch. I call it the lightning round. They're just lightweight questions, although in this film, it's tough to find lightweight questions about the film. <laughs> so I want to see how your experiences map to things sure. that happen in the movie. You can feel free not to answer them. I will not be offended, but I try to keep okay. them very answerable. I'll try. <laughs> First question is, you know, there, there is a mystical aspect in this film. Uh, have you ever had like a vision of a friend or some incident that uh, you weren't sure if it happened, and then you find out later that it happened, or you know, maybe it, it was something that gave you comfort? Oh, all the time. <laughs> oh, good. All the <laughs> because time. I see where the mysticism aspect came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, but it, sometimes it doesn't give you comfort. And sometimes yeah. you, you know, it gives you pause. Yeah. Sometimes you're, you're wondering like what the mean is uh, of it. And it, it may not mm -hmm. be a, it, it might be a message, right? Yeah. Uh, I guess in the or same vein, <laughs> <laughs> in the same vein, uh, this film does have someone seen, I guess, you know, a ghost, uh, a, a spirit of someone recently departed. Have you ever seen like what you would consider a ghost or, or a spirit or, you know, maybe, maybe that's too far on the mysticism side? You know, it's funny you say it because I was, when you said that, I'm like thinking, okay, have I? And I don't think I ever have, you know, I think I've had, you know, sort of, uh, feeling you know you get the i'm being watched but i don't think i've ever seen anybody you know or anything there you go that's that's the part. yeah I, I watch a lot of horror movies so i always have a feeling of like oh my god what's, well, that, what's that's the best part of a horror film, right i mean the best part is when you're like yeah you know yeah. don't you know when you see it it's it, it's it better be good but when you feel it 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 usually affects you more a large number of my reviews say like great build up and then when you finally like see the result you're like yeah that wasn't as good yeah, so exactly exactly um this film has a couple characters that were high school football stars. Were you a high school star of anything? Um, I grew up in Hawaii. And so, you know, uh, we, it was all mainly in the water. So I played water polo. Yeah. 
There you go. Uh, that, that, that works perfectly. It also kind of fits with the, the sports theme of the film. So I love it. Yeah, exactly. No big arenas, and, you know, no Letterman jackets, but you, know, this, you get the idea of the, of the team. Very exhausting too. Like water polo is, is an intense oh, yeah. sport. Oh yeah. Um, have you ever asked for forgiveness or had to forgive someone where it was really tough to do? Like it was, it, you know, took a lot of effort or maybe you had to come to terms before it could happen. Um, the short answer is yes. The long answer is just like the first question all the time. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I'm glad that you have, you have taken the messages of your film to heart then. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, have you ever spoken at a funeral? No, I haven't actually. Oh, that's, that's, yeah. that's probably good news. I, I think that would generally be a positive <laughs> yeah. thing. Uh, not, not, I assume you'd be no, a no. great speaker, but it's good to good to know. Yeah, no, I haven't. I, you know, I've been to a few, but I haven't spoken at them. Uh, I was, I would say there's still time, but actually, that's not really a good thing to say. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the film has an interesting kind of pendant that uh, Danny gives to Mitch. Do you have like some sort of pendant or item that uh, you know you cherish or that a friend gave you that has a specific meaning to you? Yes. Good uh, the film also has uh, a token that is thrown, um, you know, kind of, mm. I think, a burden letting go. But, you know, you could think of it also as like he's, he's giving this to his friend. Do you have something that you have either like thrown in someone's grave or like thrown you know, into like the ocean or somewhere to kind of either metaphorically give up a burden or to give something to someone in a, in a later life? Definitely in the ocean. Okay. Never in a grave. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Unless, unless it's, it's on a movie set. I've yeah. thrown a lot of things in, in movie set graves. <laughs> well, I do do action movies, so I guess that, that makes exactly. sense. Exactly. <laughs> Shot a lot of graves. <laughs> um, when was the last time that you were in what you would consider a ravine or like a, you know, I don't know, a, a, a intense valley, something like that? Um, well, nothing like the, the location in the ravine. I mean, that was just outstanding, um, you know, just in terms of the scope of it, the scale of it, and how it made you feel. But again, I'm, I'm, I'm from, you know, I'm from uh, Hawaii, so I go back to the islands when I can. And there's a number of different valleys and ravines that are pretty powerful, but nothing like the ravine uh, in the, you know, the location. Of the yeah, that was, that, was a, that was a great place to, to shoot. That was, that was, a it, was very, it was stunning. Yeah, it was it stunning. Was. Yeah. And um, dangerous as hell. <laughs> it, was, it was crumbling we kept having to move back because it was just crumbling as we were there oh my gosh that's, that sounds <laughs> <laughs> but hey you know what you do yeah. action movies that's perfect you're like ready for exactly that kind of danger. long as the camera's rolling yeah uh and the last the last question of this realm is um have you ever been like bungee jumping or base jumping no 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 even in hawaii i know that there's a lot of like yeah no of... i've jumped a lot into the water but never attached to anything <laughs> or never <laughs> with a parachute Still, still a good thrill. So the film yeah. is out May 6, 2022. You're out promoting it. You are getting the word out. Um, I'm sure you have plenty of other projects because you're, you're, you've been working a lot and you have a, a great resume. What uh, After they see the review, what else can people look forward to? Are you going to stay in the drama area, maybe go horror, or are you going to go back to action? It's funny you say that because the next one I have is a romantic comedy that I, I did in, in Hong Kong. So it's a, it's a romantic comedy set in Hong Kong. We shot it during the pandemic, um, hopefully coming out soon that um, I think people are going to like, but very different. In that one, it's not even a gun. So I went from shooting, killing people to one gun to none. So, but that's the next one up. And so, then back to action. <laughs> so sadly, the streak ends, but you know, I'm excited to see where your, your mind goes on the romantic comedy front. This is, this is uh, Keone Waxman, the writer and director of The Ravine. It's out on May 6, 2020. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no problem. Thanks a lot. That was Keone Waxman, the writer and director of The Ravine, which is coming to theaters, digital, and on demand on May 6, 2022. It is a drama inspired by true events that deals with grief and loss and also forgiveness. If you like this interview, please like and subscribe to this channel. It helps me out a lot. Make sure all my new content goes straight to you. Thank you.